In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, the ages of all ages, Amen. The Lord spoke about the eye being good, and, and a better understanding, if you want to delve into the meaning of good, is a simple eye. An eye that is good is a simple eye, is an eye that is single. You think of what does single mean here? We're talking about an eye that looks in a unified way. So we want to focus on this a bit. What did the Lord mean when he spoke about this eye being good and, and this eye being um, healthy, a healthy eye? See, there, there's, for example, you know, people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There's one person that could see a particular um, situation and look at it as very horrible and bad. Another person can look for something good within that situation. And it's yet the same thing. This is, it, again, it depends on how I choose to look. How I choose to look at the, that particular thing. So, when the Lord says your eye is the lamp of the, your body, He wasn't just talking about the physical eye. He's talking about your spiritual eye, your internal eye, how you think, how you look, how you perceive. What is your intention? What do you mean? What do you want? That's why there are times where the Lord, you know, you think it's obvious, right? Like the Lord is about to heal a man that's been paralyzed for almost, you know, 40 years, 38 years. And he tells him, do you want to be made well? Or he tells another person, what are you seeking? Or the, he asked the people that came to arrest him in Gethsemane, whom are you seeking? What do you want? Who are you looking for? This, the question is not just, oh yeah, well, it's obvious. No, it's not obvious because for one person it's one thing, from another person it could be another thing. The perception could be so different from one person to the next. The Lord says that that simple eye, that single eye, that unified eye is a healthy eye. Basically, it makes the whole body healthy. It makes sure that your whole body is healthy. Again, the whole body being healthy is not simply is not only, again, the physical body, because I could be physically blind. For example, there are people who physically cannot see light, and yet have a very healthy spiritual eye. And there are those who have physical 20-20 vision, and spiritually, they have a very unhealthy outlook on things. They don't see properly. Or they see, you know, people call it, for some people it's called cynicism. They're cynical. Some people are, they're jaded. Others, oh, this person is very judgmental. Uh, they're very contradicting. They're, you know, the list goes on of, of, of descriptions, but we're not here to describe things or bash people. That's not the point. The point is, this is kind of like what we're trying to grasp here. What is the Lord asking us to do when He's calling us to have a simple eye, that healthy eye? So I'm going to give you just three different quotes from three different people from three different walks of life, even different times in life, and see what they said about this simplicity. So, of course, everyone is familiar with this man here, Albert Einstein. He says, I have, a deep, I have deep faith that the principle of the universe will be beautiful and simple. Interesting, isn't it? Regardless of what he believed in, if he believed in God or not, that's not my point today either. But again, I have deep faith that the principle of the universe will be beautiful and simple. Beautiful and simple. Again, what is your outlook? What is your outlook? The next person you're also familiar with, I'm sure, is Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. I find this quote very interesting for those who profess Christianity. He says, you Christians, look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. He's talking to the Christian world. Regardless of your denomination, he's telling us something here about how we perceive the Word of God. Interesting, it's a nice book. It's a very important piece of literature. It's a historical uh, in interpretation of civilization. People have all kinds of definitions for the Bible, right? But look at his definition or what he said here to, to those who profess Christianity. 
For some people, the Bible is a nice big book. Sometimes they get a really nice big one, you know, it's, with, it's got a nice like leather binding and nice calligraphy and it's, it's on display in the house as, you know, part of the furniture, part of the decoration of the house. Well, that's not what the Lord is asking us to do with the Bible. That's why at the beginning of the gospel reading today, when that woman said, you know, blessed are, is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you, he said, the Lord, the Lord said, you know what? Basically, the Lord is saying, yeah, but you know what? Even more than that, blessed is he who hears the word of God and keeps it. Because that's what St. Mary did, right? She not only uh, bore the Lord incarnate, but she kept the word in her heart. She pondered all things in her heart. She lived by the word. She lived by it. So this interpretation of Gandhi here makes us think, how can we live with the word? How can we take it and live by it? Keeping the word. For some people, the Bible is unrecognizable because it's just an app on a phone or an email they receive daily with a daily verse. But for others, the Bible is a book that they hold on to physically. And it's so old. And like I've seen some people's Bibles, I was like, wow, this is impressive. Like the Bible is so used from the, from the reading, you know, from the exercise of reading the Bible. The pages are falling apart. It's got underlines and colors and all kinds of stuff all around it from cover to cover. And it needs to be like taped and bound to keep it from falling apart. For sure this person hasn't just like, you know, been playing football with their Bible. They must have been using it so much that over time, physically it's being worn and torn. But spiritually, what is it doing to them? The opposite. They're not being worn and torn. They're on the contrary being growing healthier and healthier spiritually, which is today's gospel. So Gandhi is telling us, what are you doing with your Bible? How sad is it that a man like Gandhi, right, the, the, the virtuous human being he was and what he attempted to do and what he did at the time that he lived on earth with, for him, he could not enter Christianity because of me, the Christian, because of how I portrayed Jesus to him, right? This is also something, if you read it, it's very interesting. This is another quote from Confucius. I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with Confucius. He says, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Again, you see how simplicity, like Einstein, Gandhi, Confucius, the three of them, and countless others, whether they're Christian or not, they seem to all seem to agree on something, regardless of whether they agree on God or who God is or when he was or, or who he is, they agree on simplicity being an essential part of perceiving the beauty of God and your faith and, and finding your way into the kingdom. That's why simplicity is a beautiful thing. The eye that is simple, the eye that is single, the eye that is unified, the eye that looks through a particular lens. So my question now, what is this lens? What lens are we referring to here? It's not about just what kind of glasses I wear or what binoculars I use or what my microscope or telescope. What lens am I looking through? This is, this is basically what we're being asked here. So the Lord, the, the Lord Jesus, through Scripture, gives us a hint. Well, many hints. But through St. Jude's letter, he says the following. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keeping yourself in the love of God is the lens. This is the lens by which you can have a simple, healthy eye. This is the lens by which you can have a simple, healthy body. For those of you who are currently in school, this makes no sense. I'm sure what I'm saying standing here and what you're going to hear tomorrow at school might be in many ways very different. And if you're going to go on the internet later and do your own research and see what the world views on simplicity, again, it might be very different. Fine, so be it. We're not here to try to you know, prove arguments here. It's not an argument. It's a simple fact. You either take it simply or you leave it simply. See, the Lord doesn't force anyone. The Lord never, like even that rich young ruler who came running to Jesus and knelt down on his feet at his feet and said what must I, must I do to inherit eternal life and what must I do and what must I do 
The Lord told him, do this. When he said no, or when he walked away, he didn't force him back. The Lord wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of this truth, but it can be forced, right? Otherwise, what's the point of having a free will? Otherwise, you'd be just robots and zombies. Do this. You must do this. No, you don't have to do anything. But it's, again, a choice to make. It's something to think about. So the lens of love. See, this reflection on this Bible kind of gives us the idea. You have this, like, lens, or this lens cover, and it looks really, literally like a heart on the page of the Bible. This is the lens by which you need to look through. Love is the lens. That's the Lord Jesus always looked at everyone and everything through the lens of love, regardless of what it was, regardless of what happened. You remember the scene where the eve of Good Friday, the dawn of Good Friday, what does St. Peter do to our Lord? You remember? What, did he, what happened? Denied him three times. Remember, everybody remember that or just a couple of you in the front remember that? I can hear from the back. Do you remember? Raise your hand in the back if you remember or if you're sleeping. If you're sleeping, raise your hand. Okay, very good. So, he denied him three times. He denied him three times. And it says in Luke's, St. Luke's version of the gospel, it says that the Lord turned and looked at Peter. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. How did he look at him? With anger? With wrath? With resentment? With with sadness, with grief, with remorse? Or did he look at him with the eye of love, through the lens of love, reminding him through his look that as he told him right before it happens, hours before, the devil wants to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you that you may be strengthened. And when you are restored, strengthen your brothers. When you return, strengthen your brothers. This is the eye of love. We have this capacity. It's been given to us. This is not just Oh, that's Jesus in heaven and we on earth and there's no connection. How is there no connection? When he fulfilled all righteousness by coming in the flesh, by being circumcised, by being baptized, by walking this earth all those years, he sanctified everything. He basically made everything new and good and sanctified. In other words, he said, now everything that you need to do, anything you must do, Anything you choose to do is sanctified. I've, been give, I've given you this gift all the way through the, 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 the culmination of it, which is the descent of the Holy Spirit, acquiring the Spirit. That's why when the Lord said to the disciples, when I go, I will send you a helper. This helper is the Holy Spirit. And because of the helper I'm going to send you, the, the, the things that you do, that I do, these great deeds you've seen, you're going to do greater than them because I go to the Father. How are we going to do greater than you, Lord? Because I will be doing them through you. I will be doing them through you. So I also found this interesting quote that says, those who, those who see the world through the lens of love are true visionaries. These are the ones who have vision. I'm telling you, you can be physically blind as a bat. But spiritually, you can see wonders if you want. But sadly, the world has kind of like conditioned us to seek to see physically, to seek appearances, to look for the outward appearance, to care very much of what people think, that I lose track of what heaven thinks, or what heaven is expecting for me and of me. So I can't necessarily do that. But if I choose this lens to imitate Jesus and how he looks at things, I will develop that simple eye, that healthy eye, that my, the lamp of my body will be a good one will be a healthy one. And everything I think, everything I do, everything I say, the way I interpret and perceive everything will be through that lens. This is up to me. It's up to you. It's up to us. We need to choose one or the other. You can't have both. You can't have both. But you can definitely have it if you want it. This is the beauty of that potential. I'm going to read you a quote from Henry Nouwens. You remember, we've spoken of some of his quotes from before. He says something very interesting about God. He says, most of us, I'll put it for you so you can read it. Most of us distrust God. Most of us think of God as a fearful, punitive authority or as an empty, powerless nothing. 
Jesus' core message was that God is neither a powerless weakling nor a powerful boss, but a lover whose only desire is to give us what our hearts most desire. To pray is to listen to that voice of love. That is what obedience is all about. The word obedience comes from the Latin word obudire, which means to listen with great attentiveness. So the idea is, how can I listen very attentively to what God is trying to tell me? Look at what he continues to say. Without listening, we become deaf to the voice of love. The Latin word for deaf is surdis. To be completely deaf is to be absurdus. Yes, absurd. Everyone knows what something absurd is. When we no longer pray, no longer listen to the voice of love that speaks to us in the moment, our lives become absurd lives in which we are thrown back and forth between the past and the future. If we could just be for a few minutes each day fully where we are, we would indeed discover that we are not alone and that the one who is with us wants one, only one thing, to give us love. See, it's either I want to be very obedient to the word and keep it and live by it, or I become absurd and pursue other things and become unhealthy, completely unhealthy spiritually. So it's again a choice. Another quote I found from one of the Greek Orthodox elders, he says, a person can be raised up above the earth by two wings. Sim one is simplicity and the other is purity of heart. You must be simple in your actions and pure in your thoughts and feelings. With a pure heart, you will seek God and with simplicity, you will find him and be glad. A pure heart passes through heaven's gate with ease. Again, these are all possibilities for each and every one of us. There's a beautiful verse in one of the Psalms that says, Teach me o your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Again, to, to be unified, to have simple eye. Another version of that same verse, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Again, asking for it from the Lord regularly, it will be granted over time. I'll be actually able to perceive through a very simple single eye. Simple eye. Like when the Lord says, unless you are converted and become as children, you cannot enter the kingdom because children have a simple eye. They're innocent, right? They see things as they are. We can see Jesus as he is. That's what we're called to do. And this will progressively happen now and in eternity. Again, if we, if we choose it, if we wish it. You remember this scene here? What happens here? Who recalls this scene? Yes, sir. Cristiano. Jesus walked on water. Absolutely, thank you. So Jesus walks on water, right? And then what does St. Peter do? When he sees this, they're all in the boat, right? Anthony. You raised your head, so I just wanted to give you a chance. Go ahead. Hey? They were all scared. You're right. And then St. Peter said, If it's you, Lord, tell me to come onto the water. If it's you, tell me to come to walk on the water. What did the Lord Jesus tell St. Peter here? How many words? What did he tell him? So, well, you know, I'm not sure. You have to think about it. It's kind of cold. There's waves. It's dark. There might be fish. I'm not sure if you're... Do you like to swim? Have you swam before? None of these questions. The Lord just said one word. What was that one word? Come. Come. You want? Come. Why did St. Peter say... Like, St. Peter didn't say, okay, let me think about it. Is it cold? Let me just touch the water. See, it's a little chilly at this hour of the night. What did St. Peter do when the Lord said, Come. Jacob, he came. Thank you, exactly. He just put his foot out of the boat and started walking. Started walking on water. Who walks on water? Who can walk on water? What, why did St. Peter walk on water here? What do you think? Now, I want you to think of the answer in context to the point of a simple, single eye, a unified mind, the lens of love. Why did St. Peter just simply come? Okay. Started walking on water. What? Huh? Faith? 
focused on Jesus, not the water. Okay, thank you so much. So when he focused on Jesus, not on the water, what does it mean that he focused on Jesus? Why did he focus on Jesus? What is it about his relationship with Jesus that led him to walk on the water? Trust. What else? Pardon? Who said love? Yes, thank you. He, he loved Jesus. Don't, don't get fooled. Don't think because St. Peter denies Jesus on the eve of Good Friday because he didn't love him. He loves him very much. And that's why the Lord asked him three times after the resurrection, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So the Lord said, well, I'm not sure if you love me. He said, feed my lambs. Do you love me? You, you know all things. You know that I love you. You know. He knows very well that St. Peter loves him. And St. Peter knew very well that he loved his Lord. It's love that led him to walk on water. You see the point? It's his love. When he started to sink and, and, and fall in the water, it's because all of a sudden, he didn't, not that he stopped loving his Lord, but his focus, the lens that he was looking through, the lens of love, all of a sudden shifted into a lens of, well, wait a minute, oh my goodness, this is water. This is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there's a storm, it's dark, the boat is getting further and further away. Whoa, it's windy, I'm getting really wet and cold. I can't take it anymore. Uh, he started to sink. It wasn't a lack of love, it was just the lens, the shift, all of a sudden it just focused on something else. It's like I took the camera, I turned it on something else. Or I kind of like, the lens was crystal clear. But all of a sudden, I just kind of like changed it a bit so it became all fuzzy. Couldn't see anymore. I lost my vision. My eye was no longer healthy. This is what happened. But what does the Lord do? Well, sorry, you didn't trust me. Goodbye. Of course not. He grabbed him right away. Because he loves us an everlasting love. That's why St. John says we love him because he first loved us. It's the, love is the bond of perfection, St. Paul says. It's the bond, it completes everything. It makes everything perfect. So if you seek to do this, you'll walk on water in your life, in your heart. I'm not asking you to go to walk on Lake St. Louis right now. That's not the point. But you will walk on water in your heart. You will pursue the Lord deeper. Just like when the Lord first told St. Peter, launch into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Your life with him will change. The dynamics of your relationship will be deeper and healthier. What your heart truly desires, by the way, whether you know it or not, whether you believe me or not, that's not a problem. But your heart wants this. This is the desire of our heart, to be united with he who loved us in everlasting love. So when St. Paul says, love bears all things, believes all things. Hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. If you look through this lens of love, I promise you, your eye will become healthier and healthier and stronger and stronger. I'm talking about your spiritual eye. Every day, your outlook on life will change. You will become a true visionary, a true Christ bearer, a true Christophoros, bearer of Christ. Not just a Christian by name, but a Christian by inner identity. It will no longer matter to you as much about how you look on the outside and what people think of you or want of you on the outside, but your constant focus will always shift back to what is the voice of love telling you softly and gently in your heart. This will be your constant heartbeat, and you're going to be constantly gearing to that, listening for that. Your ear will always be on that. I promise you, it will come, and God will fulfill the desires of your heart. Let's pray for this today. Can we pray this today together in the liturgy? Can, we, can you repeat after me? God, help me to put what I learn from your word into daily practice. Glory be to God.